thank you all for uh, thank you for being here. And uh, now that I think we're all here, so let us uh, begin. Uh, let me uh, do a little formal uh, uh, introduction, Chancellor. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of New York Law School and Dean Anthony Crowell, I welcome you all to the 183rd City Law Breakfast that began back in 1994. I am Ross Sandler, Professor of Law and Director of the Center for New York City Law, and I've hosted these breakfasts from the beginning. Thank you for attending and helping to make these breakfasts such an important public forum. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, immediately uh, first our three generous and loyal founding sponsors of the City Law Breakfast. They are Consolidated Edison, Verizon, and the law firm of Greenberg Trari. And I also want to thank those attending the breakfast. We have almost 250 people signed up, and we're delighted so many did. I also want to thank the those of you who made voluntary contributions when you signed up to attend the breakfast. Your name will be prominently listed in the email sent to those after the breakfast. Um, after Chancellor Banks' prepared remarks, we'll have a question and comment session. You may submit a question or a comment at any time during the breakfast, and we encourage you to do so. We collect the questions and comments as they come in. Uh, to submit a question or comment, please use the Q&A function on your uh, screen. And I, we do ask you to identify yourself, first name and last name, and your organization. That is helpful. And the following the questions and comments, Anthony Crowell, Dean of the Law School, will join us for a, a conversation. We are delighted to welcome Chancellor David Banks to our City Law Breakfast Series. David Banks was born in Brooklyn, attended PS 161 in Brooklyn, and then Hillcrest High School in Queens. He graduated from Rutgers University and in 1993, St. John's Law School. Banks' career, though, and his passion has been public education, especially for young boys of color. Within two years of getting his JD, uh, Banks enrolled in night classes to earn enough credits to become a school administrator and with his new credentials became an assistant principal at PS191 in Crown Heights. Two years later, Richard Kahn, a friend, picked Banks to head one of the Urban Assembly's new schools, the Bronx School for Law, Government, and Justice. And seven years later, Banks was the founding principal of the Eagle Academy for Young Men, which was located in the Bronx. The goal of the Eagle Academies is to reach boys of color who have traditionally not been well served by the city's public schools. There are now six Eagle Academies, one in each of the five boroughs and one in Newark, New Jersey. Banks in 2015 published a really interesting book called SOAR, How Boys Learn, Succeed and Develop Character. SOAR is partly autobiographical about his growing up with his brother and his family, partly a teaching guide and partly a history of the Eagle Academies. In SOAR, Banks laid out uh, the philosophy and goals for the education of boys that Banks developed for the Eagle Academy. And he did that in three questions. What do boys need as they are, are to, what do boys need if they are to blossom, both as scholars and as men? How can we make sure each young man receives the support necessary to overcome whatever threats his environment may pose and to reinforce the gifts and strengths he already has? And where can families and schools find the additional resources to provide that extra reinforcement in a time of shrinking budgets and lowered expectations? Banks brings to bear these goals and experiences to his new job as Chancellor of the City Schools. We are honored to welcome Chancellor Banks to the City Law Breakfast. Chancellor Banks, the floor is yours. Ross, thank you so very, very much. I, I deeply appreciate uh, this opportunity to be with you, and I certainly appreciate the invitation. Um, and to all the law students, the professors, the government officials uh, who are here today, thank you uh, uh, all for, for, for joining the breakfast today. Um, as you pointed out, I'm a product of New York City Public Schools. I'm not just a Brooklyn kid, I'm a Brooklyn Queens kid. Um, um, my mom and dad raised three boys. I'm the oldest of three. I have a brother, Philip, who's a year younger than me, and some of some of you in your audience may know uh, or have heard of him as well. He used to be the chief of the department on the New York City Police Department, uh, the four-star chief, and now he's the deputy mayor uh, for uh, public safety. Uh, my dad did uh, almost a 30-year career in the NYPD, 
So, um, so we grew up in a household um, that was very much dedicated to, uh, to public service. And, um, and, and that is what my focus has been on as well. Um, moved out to Queens when I was about 12 years old um, with an intention of being a lawyer one day. And I did go on to ultimately uh, graduate from St. John's Law School. I, I, I spent a year at the uh, uh, New York uh, City Law Department in Brooklyn. Um, and I spent some time at the Attorney General's office. Uh, it was a guy named Bob Abrams years ago. And then I spent about a year with Oliver Capel uh, when he was the interim Attorney General. But as fate would have it, my, my, my real, uh, I think, destiny was working in education and working with young people. Um, I had been a teacher during the day while I was going to law school at night. And uh, so shout out to all those who go into law school uh, at night. I know it is not part-time. It is a full-time situation. You had a family, you've got a career. It is not easy to do. Um, but that was the path uh, that I chose. And, uh, and I think it set me on a course for what I'm ultimately um, doing right now. I've, I've known the mayor, Mayor Adams, for, I don't know, close to 30 years. And, uh, and so he has not only um, been a professional colleague, uh, but he's also been a, a friend. And, um, and so, as you pointed out, Ross, you know, prior to becoming the uh, chancellor, I was the head of the Eagle Academy Foundation. And the reason that I did that work was because I was very committed to trying to uncover um, what were some of the major barriers preventing young men of color, particularly black and Latino boys in our schools from achieving the level of success that other students were achieving. And, um, and that was very personal to me, as you can imagine. And I threw myself into that together working with my organization, 100 Black Men. Um, we created the Eagle Academy as the first all boys public uh, high school in New York City in almost 30 years when we opened our doors um, uh, and back in 1994, uh, 2004 rather. Um, and from there, uh, I've been just very committed to that work. We've opened up uh, an Eagle Academy in every borough uh, in New York City. We opened up one in Newark, New Jersey. When Cory Booker was the mayor, he asked that we go there as well. And we did that work uh, in Newark. Today, the Eagle Academy has 3,000 boys from grade six all the way through grade 12. We've graduated well over 2,000, sent them to colleges and universities across the nation. Um, and, the, um, and it was that body of work that was really the inspiration for the mayor even asking me to come and take this position. Uh, and so I've had the good fortune of having a very close relationship with the mayor. Um, and I think that that is um, that kind of alignment sets us up, I think, for a really solid opportunity to be successful uh, going forward. And so I'm here as chancellor of New York City Public Schools and just want to talk to you a little bit about that and uh, what we intend to, to try and do. And, and I, I often po pose this essential question, which is, um, you know, why do we send our children to school in the first place? What is the purpose of school? You know, I've, I've, I've often used the analogy that uh, kids who play sports or football, as an example, they will, they will go to uh, practice. They will do all of those wind sprints. They will work really hard um, and sacrifice because they're very clear about what the goal is. And the goal is to win the game. The goal is to win the championship, to get the trophy. They're very clear what they're, what they're aiming for. But in our public schools, uh, far too many of our kids are not really clear about why they go to school. What is the ultimate goal? Um, and it can't be, well, one day we want you to go to college. Well, we're going to college toward what end? Um, and, and so for me, it's very important you know, that we've established that our mission here at New York City Public Schools uh, is to ensure that each student graduates on a pathway to a rewarding career, long-term economic security, and equipped to be a positive force for change um, in our society. And that's very clear what we're trying to do and we're really doing everything we can to spread the word so that everybody is very clear. Our rallying cry to achieve that is what I refer to as bright starts 
and bold futures. Bright starts and bold futures. And so I wanna just talk to you a little bit about each one of those because they set up the framework for everything that we're doing here um, at New York City Public Schools. Uh, which by the way, um, I've gotten away from using the term, the DOE or the Department of Education. Uh, we were the only school system in the nation um, that in our title, we don't even refer to students. Um, if you go to Chicago, they call, it's called Chicago Public Schools. If you go to uh, Atlanta, it's Atlanta Public Schools. So from here on out, we're really trying to refer to this as New York City Public Schools and not the Department of Education. The Department uh, of Education uh, connotes a, um, a bureaucracy, something cold, unfeeling. Um, and I think there's a reason why so many of our families have felt a level of disconnect uh, from us as an, as an agency. And I think that language does matter. So we are New York City Public Schools. Um, and so on my very first day as chancellor, um, I saw a gentleman standing outside and he was holding up a sign in front of our building. Um, it said, if we would just teach the kids to read. And I went up to him and I told him, I said, I absolutely agree with you. He said, it would save you so much money. You have to, you, you're spending millions of dollars to try and fix a system that if you ensured that the kids could read no later than the third grade, you would solve so many of your problems. And, uh, and I told him, that's what I'm absolutely committed to. And he said, I wish you well. This gentleman has been standing out in front of our building for 10 years. And he engages people who walk up and down and pass our headquarters. Um, just starting a conversation around why reading and literacy is so critically important and not sure why we're not fully engaged in making sure that that happens. For 65% of black and brown children in the New York City public schools, they never achieve reading proficiency. And if you think about that for a moment, this is a system that has a 38 annual billion dollar budget. And yet 65% of black and brown kids never achieve proficiency in reading. It's shameful and in many ways should just be unacceptable. Um, and we're gonna change that, we're gonna fix that. And that's what I'm committed to. Um, uh, but let me, and, and, for, and for black and brown uh, children uh, and for black and brown boys, the statistics are even worse than that. And so we've got, we certainly got our work cut out for us. Over the last 25 to 30 years, we shifted from the phonetic approach to teaching kids how to read, which for many people in this audience is probably the way that they learn to read. Um, we shifted to what was called balanced literacy, a whole language approach, very different approach. Um, and it got away from the basics of how we, we teach kids to read. And the results are in. And unfortunately, for so many of our kids, particularly kids of color, um, it has not worked. And so we are disbanding that. We are shifting to a, an old, a, a new old approach to teaching uh, reading. And uh, that is a heavy focus that we're having. We're retraining our teachers and ensuring that we are uh, making sure that any of our kids who suffer from dyslexia, uh, this is personal for the mayor. The mayor is dyslexic. It, was, it wasn't diagnosed until he was in college. We've got thousands of our kids in our system right now who suffer from dyslexia and other reading challenges and have never been properly diagnosed and we just continue to move them on through the system. And so we're doing something about that. We're gonna make a real difference. All teachers in kindergarten through 12th grade are participating in a multiple week introductory training on identifying those students with dyslexia. Uh, we're gonna to return to the basic core instructional focus of teaching kids uh, how to read. I'm gonna make sure that even all of our multilingual uh, learners and students with disabilities have access to the tools and the skills that they need to be successful. Um, so these are things that are real priority for me. Uh, if we don't establish that foundation, uh, and certainly no later than the third grade, because all the research and the science tells us if kids can't read by the third grade, um, uh, you're, you're fighting a significant uphill battle after that. And so we gotta get it right at the very beginning. And that's how bright, how bright starts. But then I wanna tell you about our, our bold future. So the bold futures is really, okay, what happens at the other end of the spectrum? Kids have done everything that you ask them to do. They go to school every day, they show up, they work hard, 
They pass the various tests and assessments that they have to take. Now what? Uh, for far too many kids, um, they are graduating. We're giving them a diploma um, and they don't have the requisite, requisite skills to get a real job. Uh, many of them are not fully prepared to go to college or certainly to complete college. Because the reality for us is that um, we're only, we're only gra graduating from our colleges about 33% of six years after they start college, only 33% of New York City public school students are earning at least a two or four year degree, only 33%. And so um, we've, got to, we've got to fix that. Those, those numbers are, are, are woefully low. And in order for us to fix that, I have a very passionate opinion <laughs> that the reason why kids are disconnected even from the career pathways, they're not getting any exposure while they're in, uh, in school, particularly in high school. They, they don't understand what the world of work is because we've not exposed them to it. The 21st century of, of workforce requires young people to have some level of credentials. And we think that we can provide those credentials and that clarity of focus while they're in our schools. And we can start a lot of that work even as early as middle school, where they're getting a level of exposure to the world of work. For many of our kids, it's hard to dream of becoming an investment banker if you've never met one. It's hard to dream. You can dream of being a lawyer because kids have heard about lawyers, but the law profession itself is a wide array of career opportunities. Um, many of which kids have no idea about. But if they had an idea and they had some level of exposure, then they realize why they need to work so hard in their math class, their science class, why they've got to develop their writing skills while they're in school. For us, we just take them through the, what I call the routinization of school. They have to go to school every day simply because they must, uh, but they don't understand why and what the end product could ultimately be. Far too many kids have no clue. Uh, I, I visited Rikers Island recently and I saw a number of young people, particularly young men, and I asked them about their journey. Why, how did they wind up in, in jail? And for each single one of them, they talked about their ultimate disconnect from school. School was not relevant to them. They didn't understand why they had to be there. Um, it was just a compliance experience for them. And at some point they give up on it and they're in the streets. And once they're in the streets, they find themselves caught up in the criminal justice system. And yet they were in Rikers Island and they were taking courses in HVAC and electrical and plumbing and very, very engaged, smart young people. One young man put his hand up and he said, mister, if I was doing these kinds of things when I was in high school, I would have gone to school every day. And you think about just how, how unfortunate that is that you'd have to wind up going to jail before you could find a path forward for yourself um, in this 21st century uh, economy. We can and we must do better. We can and we must do better. That is what I'm uh, very connected to, what I'm very committed to, is creating what we are calling career-connected learning. Student pathways, where young people have a very clear lane of possibility. It doesn't always mean you're gonna know what you wanna do for the rest of your life at 14 or 15 years old, but we want them to have some level of clarity around their interests that we can shape how they're moving in school and create a very different school experience for kids. School should not simply be about did we, did we increase our math scores or our ELA scores by two or three points. Um, we have been so committed to that over these past several decades that we've missed the very purpose of why we send kids to school in the first place. And so we are trying to reconnect um, to real opportunities that I think when we help kids figure out their aha, when they get their own, when they come to that, they will run toward those opportunities. Um, but, but, but we need help in order to do that. We've had a lot of folks who have started to help, help us. We've created two programs so far that we are looking to continue to expand. Um, one is called the Career Readiness and Modern Apprenticeship Program, which is a historic expansion of career-connected learning 
Um, we've so far been able to lay out over 3,000 kids who are getting paid youth apprenticeships for New York City public school students in the 11th grade. Uh, we've been working very closely with Jamie Dimon, uh, the uh, New York City CEO Jobs Council. They've signed on to be partners with us um, in this place and in, in this space. It's making a huge difference. Uh, Northwell Health, the largest health provider uh, in the state of New York, has signed on to be a partner uh, for us to provide real world exposure and opportunities for kids so that it helps to make their school experience much more uh, relevant, uh, uh, which I think makes for a very different uh, student in our schools. Um, we've also announced something that we call Future Ready NYC. And it gives uh, the schools that are partnering with us in our school system access to career exposure and experience and high growth fields, including healthcare, technology, business, and education. We're continuing to expand on all those uh, on all those programs, and so um, these are just an example of some of the kinds of things that we are we are doing. Some of the kinds of things that we're very focused on. Um, and there's nothing greater than when kids get to their own aha moment. It transforms how they move in school. Um, I'm convinced that all of our kids, black, brown, Asian, white, whoever they are, they're all filled with brilliance. Potential, promise. The only difference between those who make it and those who don't is the level of exposure that they get to what the possibilities could be for their careers and for their lives. If a young person thinks that one day they might be a lawyer, um, I don't have to tell them that you, know, you shouldn't go and join a gang. Kids who join gangs and get engaged in negative behavior are kids who don't see the possibilities for themselves. So my job here as chancellor is to create a much greater degree of possibility for kids. But I can't do that without your help. Um, and so for those who are, who are participating today, um, who'd like to participate and help us um, by providing some opportunities for young people, um, uh, please, we, you can reach us at futureReadyNYC at schools.nyc.gov, futureReadyNYC at schools.myc.gov. We'd encourage you to be partners with us in this. We, we cannot ensure a level of success for the young people in the New York City public schools um, unless we are partnering with the business community or with the legal profession, with others in government, in the tech industry. Um, we're trying to open up the doors to say, we need you. We need you to be guest speakers coming and talking to kids across our schools. We need you to open up opportunities for internships, opportunities for apprenticeships, where kids can have a chance to actually get paid while they're gain, gaining some real experiences. Um, and, uh, and I understand the reality. A lot of businesses are saying, listen, we'd love to help, but I don't know what to do with a bunch of 16-year-olds running around my company. Um, we have ways in which we can manage that and help to make it a productive experience, uh, even for your businesses. Um, and so that's where we are. I'm gonna get ready to, to kind of wrap up at this time and simply say that Bright Starts, Bold Futures is what we're doing. It is our primary focus. Creating career-connected learning opportunities for young people is the way to go. And you can't do it unless they've got a solid literacy foundation. They've gotta know how to read, they've gotta know how to write, They've got to be solid students. We're working on developing that. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen over a period of time. But at the end of the day, we want kids to understand uh, what the opportunities are for themselves. Um, and we're certainly hopeful uh, that there's some uh, who are participating in that, uh, in this uh, Zoom today that might say, hey, uh, we can't solve all the problems, but we'd like to be helpful in this process. Uh, the mayor has put the call out for the business community to get involved. And I'm certainly echoing his comments uh, and doing that again myself this morning. Uh, and so from there, I, I guess I'm certainly more than willing to take any, um, any questions at this point um, that, that folks may have. Okay, thank you so much for those full remarks and for all that you're doing. Uh, I, I might just respond immediately to one of your requests. I'm on the board of New York Edge, which is one of your largest providers of after-school programs. And we have speakers who come to talk about jobs, and we do a lot on uh, helping ch uh, children to, to stay in school and to do better at school. 
And uh, so I just uh, want to say that New York Edge and the other after school providers are with you 100% on a lot of this. And thank you for uh, continuing to help the funding of these organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Uh, I like the first question is from Jonathan Taylor, who raises the uh, who, who follows up on your information or discussion of dyslexia and asks whether there might also be a program on hearing loss for students who also uh, have great difficulty in school because of hearing uh, uh, impairments. You know, that's so, that's such an interesting question because that's something we're actually looking at right now. We've been studying this issue, um, and we've heard from a number of the advocates who are strongly encouraging us to do more around that. We do early screening for hearing loss as students actually make their way into the school system, but there are calls for us to do more further down the line as well. So um, more to come on that. We're actually we're actually exploring that issue uh, as we speak. Good, uh, I encourage people to, uh, to type in questions on the Q&A. Here's a question from Francie, I didn't give her last name, um, about debate. She's at Eagle Academy, uh, you emphasize debate skills. What can attorneys do now to support and advance the advancement of debate prowess uh, among the New York City Schools uh, students? I, I found that debate is one of the most impactful experiences that you can take kids through. Why? Because when debate is done well, not only are you developing public speaking skills, uh, you're developing confidence, self-efficacy, um, you're developing writing skills, you're developing research skills, you're developing listening skills. You gotta, gotta listen to what the other side is saying if you're gonna develop a cogent argument uh, to counter that. Um, so, so debate as, as, as an enterprise is something that I think is very, very important uh, and tremendously impactful. And, um, and again, anyone here that would, would like to be supportive around that issue in the area, uh, we certainly welcome your support. Uh, you can certainly reach out uh, to us. We'd love to, we'd love to get you engaged. Um, it was not a priority issue for me walking in the door. I've, you know, I'm just coming up on wrapping up my first year as chancellor, and there have been so many issues that have been major priorities and things that have to be fixed in our system. Uh, but as the dust is beginning to settle just a little bit, um, I'm, I've certainly made note of that. A uh, debate was a very big deal with what we did uh, at the Eagle Academy. We had kids uh, who were traveling and debating, um, and there are varying forms of debate, um, and kids who were debating really across the nation. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad that it was just mentioned. I just took note of that as well to something to kind of lift up uh, even now. Good. Here's a, a comment by Tamara, again, not a last name. The career placement program is very beneficial. I partic participated in this program. So it's not a question, but she uh, applauds the career placement program. Thank you. Uh, Paul uh, Gottsagen, uh, do you think DYCD uh, uh, is re, uh, refocused to align with your ideas of supporting programs that promote career connected learning instead of simply using attendance as a metric. Yes, I agree with you. Yes. So we are building these relationships across the board with various uh, mayoral agencies. Uh, Keith Howard is the uh, commission over there at DYCD. We've been meeting regularly and uh, talking about ways in which we can work together um, to support these various efforts. One of, one of the very next things I'm going to talk to him about is the issue around debate and what we can do there. Uh, but they are certainly in line with us around career connected learning. We're just getting a lot of this off the ground, uh, but there are there is a meeting of the minds um, that we can't afford to continue to work in silos. We have to be connected um, if we want to be most impactful. We can make some things happen working in silos. Um, but 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 if you want to be really impactful and transformative, uh, you have to work together. Uh, as soon as I leave this meeting, I'm heading to a, a meeting at the mayor's office with all the deputy mayors and multiple heads of various city agencies. And we, we talk about how we bring our work together for maximum impact. And uh, so I appreciate that question as well. Thank you. This is from Ed LaGrasa. Uh, he says, have the teachers and unions signed on to your approaches? So there's always that issue. How are you doing yeah. with the unions and teachers? I've, ha I've had a great um, 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 experience uh, so far with, with all the unions, uh, from the UFT to uh, CSA, which handles all the principals and, and the system principals and school administrators. 
uh, DC 37, all of them. Um, uh, they know I have an, I, not only do I have an open door, they call me on a regular basis and uh, we speak, we meet regularly. And uh, I'm a person who's very collaborative. I don't believe that we need to have pitch battles um, when uh, communication really should rule the day. You may not always agree, uh, but we should not be disagreeable. And, uh, and we certainly shouldn't be uh, disagreeing about things that are easy to agree on. Uh, it just takes just a matter of us coming together and talking them through. So, you know, fingers crossed, so far so good. Um, they've all been very open. And, and, and again, I believe, you know, you, you can't run a department this large, an agency this large without partners. You know, we are the largest school system in the world by far. Los Angeles is second to New York, and it's almost just half the size. So, you know, Chicago is third. It's not, it's, it's, it's barely a third of the size of New York. So New York is in a category all of its own, just on its sheer enormity and, 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 and scale. Um, and so in order for you to, you, you can't run something like that by fiat. You can't run it, you know, because the chancellor said, that doesn't get it. You, you've got to have partners spread out all across the city uh, if you want to have real impact. And so uh, that's what I'm committed to. So uh, my relationship with the union so far has been very, very good. good. Okay, this is from Allison Morpurgo. Says, what is New York Public Schools doing to support kids in high schools struggling with school refusal or anxiety around going to school post pandemic, particularly where the school administration's unresponsive? Is that, uh, so she raises the issue of that of students not going to school. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the bigger issues we are dealing with is something we call chronic absenteeism. Um, and those are those are not those are kids who are missing a significant number of days. So we're actually getting ready to make an announcement in about a week from now, um, together with the mayor's office, around a whole plan that we have to address that. And suffice it to say, a lot of it is going to be. Uh, the full-on deployment of people who are actually out knocking on doors um, and, and, and getting uh, parents uh, and, and families uh, clear. A reason why a lot of these kids miss school is not necessarily because of school. There's often a, a, a deeper levels of dysfunction that these folks have found themselves in, making it very difficult. Um, and so that, that's going to require more than just what the chancellor can do. That's why it's a cross agency uh, uh, effort that will be made uh, to deal with this. Um, but you have to know as well, um, we lost 120,000 families over the last five years who've left the New York City schools, most of whom have left New York, but many of even those of who have even stayed in New York have just left our schools. Some have gone to charter schools, some have gone to private schools, and some have just stopped going to school altogether. Um, 70,000 in just the last two years alone. But all the indicators now are showing to shift back the other way. Um, and since I've been here as chancellor, uh, we've done a, a good job with our team of beginning to change the narrative around what's going on in our schools and, uh, and beginning to lift it up. You know, the New York City Public Schools has never done a good enough job of promoting itself. We, we got some of the charter groups have done a great job of advertising, promotion, and uh, uh, creating an experience where people want to go to those schools. Families want to send their kids to those schools. Um, New York City schools have always kind of played defense. There are many schools that are doing great work, but you've never even heard of them. They haven't been lifted up. They haven't been celebrated. We don't advertise them. We don't promote them. Um, but that work is changing now, and we're beginning to stem that tide and to talk about the great work that is actually going on. And I think that affects the psyche of people when they do realize that, you know, we got a lot of great schools in New York City and more than just a handful of specialized schools. It's more than just Stuyvesant or Brooklyn Tech or Bronx High School of Science. We've got a lot of other schools that are not even specialized schools that are on par and in some ways better than any of those schools with the various things that they're actually offering our kids. But many people across the general public have no idea about these schools. Um, so that's my job. Is to, is to change that narrative by lifting up what's going on. Um, and that's what we're doing. We think that'll help even for those who've not been going to school as well. But some of those are gonna need a more focused effort at getting them back. And that's part of what we're working on now um, to re-engage those students and their families. 
Uh, here's a question from Beatrice Weber. Um, she says, um, how is DOE preparing to comply with the guidelines uh, that the Board of Regents passed in September for private school oversight? We know uh, that right now the Office of, uh, of Non-Public Schools has a very small staff and there are thousands of Hasidic children and graduates of New York City not being taught to read or write. So it's about the new rules and, and new jobs imposed upon you. And yeah, the yeah, it's a, it's a very kind of fraught political question uh, in many ways. Um, uh, my goal, my focus is to ensure that all kids, whether they're in the traditional New York City public schools or otherwise, are getting a good education. Um, so we have met with many members of the uh, Hasidic community, particularly in, you know who are overseeing the uh, the yeshivas. Uh, we've been working closely uh, with Dr. Betty Rosa, Dr. Lester Young at the state level around this issue. Um, and we've got a team of folks here who've been going out uh, and, and, and getting into those schools as well. Um, you know, some of the new rules talk about what's referred to as substantial equivalency. Essentially, those schools don't necessarily have to line up exactly the way public schools are doing their work, but we need, to, there's a certain minimum standard that you certainly have to meet as it relates to math and English and social studies and the like. Um, so we're working cl closely uh, with, with these schools. Uh, we've been in and out of many of them. Um, and uh, but with these new, the promulgation of these new rules, um, we are, we, we're re-engaging uh, with them as well. So, uh, so stay tuned, um, uh, not an easy issue, uh, particularly when you wrap in a kind of a level of religious fervor as well. Um, uh, does not make for always an easy way to do this, but it is one that we are committed to as well. There's a couple of people who have chimed in on that question as well. So I'm sure it's a, a <laughs> high on your list. Yes. Uh, this is from L, uh, uh, L. Fairweather. Um, we at Medgar Evers College Prep School are disappointed in the slow progress of our expected new building. We desperately need it. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, no, listen, I understand. That's, that's, an, that's a question that's germane to a very specific school. Uh, I, I've been very supportive um, to the principal at that school and to that school community already on a number of fronts uh, as it relates to Mega. Uh, and so, um, um, but again, a place as large as this doesn't move that quickly. Um, there are other challenges and we have expressed that with the school leadership. Uh, we, we work, we're working hard to ultimately get uh, those at Mega a new space. Uh, and it will happen. Uh, it may not happen as quickly as some folks would like to see it happen. Unfortunately, uh, when I was at the uh, Bronx School for Law, Government, and Justice, uh, we got a new building. Uh, we were told it was gonna take about two years. It took about six years. Uh, when I was at the Eagle Academy, we got a new building. We were told it was gonna take three years. It took about five years. Um, that's just the way it works sometimes. And in, in a bureaucracy as large as this, um, but but they are absolutely one of our priorities, along with many others. And everybody is saying the same thing. We want it, and we want it yesterday. Um, and we're doing as best we can, working together with the school construction authority. Um, there are lots of rules and regulations around how schools get built and designed. And there's community uh, uh, impact statements and measures that have to happen, and, and these things take time to do. So, uh, but it will happen. May I just say, push on and push hard. From your <laughs> position, you should be able to do be helpful there. Yes. Um, yes. Let's see. Uh, here's a sort of a compliment. Uh, Paola Abergini, the Center for Educational ed Education. Education is here to support you, Chancellor, through our college and career readiness initiatives and our after school program, Project Boost. So that's another. Uh, David Banks, you're, uh, you're just, you, we lost your picture. There we go. Oh, no. I just here's David down. Broomfield. Oh, good. Okay, here's <laughs> David Broomfield. How uh, can this your bold vision be accomplished with the decreased um, DOE budget agreed to by the mayor and city council where schools had to fire teachers and important support staff such as counselors and social workers so needed post-pandemic? And this is from Professor David Bloomfield, Brooklyn yes. College. Yes, I know Professor Bloomfield. It was good seeing him uh, last night at a forum that I did out at the Queens Public Library uh, as well. Uh, it is a challenge, Professor, and it is a challenge that I think is going to become more acute. New York City is uh, facing some very difficult financial days ahead over these next two or three years. 
Um, and I think we're going to be looking at uh, budget challenges that are much more significant than what people were complaining about um, during this last cycle. So uh, we have to stay tuned uh, to see how it plays out. Um, it's, not, it's not easy. I'm the chancellor. I, I want as, as many dollars as I can possibly get for all of our schools and for all of our kids. And I'm going to continue to fight for that. But I also know that I am, I am one agency. It's the biggest agency, but I'm one agency uh, within the New York City uh, uh, system. Um, and, and everybody is fighting for dollars. Uh, we don't want to lose anything. Nobody wants to lose social workers or guidance counselors or the, the art teacher or anything else. Um, and yet, you know, we have fiscal reality that we have to deal with. We have a $38 billion annual budget, but I'm going to be spending some time in the coming weeks, months, explaining how that budget actually works, because most people, I don't think, fully appreciate um, what that $38 billion actually goes to. Out of that $38 billion, about almost $18 billion of it actually goes directly to schools. Um, you can take $10 billion right off the top. It, it, it goes to pensions and debt service. Um, you got another close to $5 billion, which goes to transportation and food. We got to feed the kids and, you know, uh, facilities. You know, you just heard the person before say they want a new building for Mega Evers. Those are dollars that come from the budget. Um, and so when you, when you take all of that into account and you break it out, I'm going to be explaining to the broader community more clearly what that $38 billion pie actually looks like. Um, we give $3 billion every year to, to, to charter schools. Most people don't know that. Um, it's, it's dollars that are earmarked from the state to the charters, but it runs through our coffers. Um, and it gets, you know, we turn it out to the charter schools. That's part of the 38. And it's something that we don't have any choice over. It's legally mandated. It's not ours. It just runs through our, our budget right back out to charter schools. But people don't know that. They have no, people don't have much of an idea around what the dollars really look like and what you can spend. But we're gonna take what we do have, fight for everything that we can get. And I've gotta figure out how to take whatever we wind up with and make it work as best I can. There's not much more that I'm gonna be able to, to do about that. And the fight is on with the city council and the mayor. They gotta, they gotta get in the room and hash it out. And ultimately I work with the budget that I'm given not the one that I wish that I had. And so uh, I appreciate that question. It's always one of the toughest things to deal with when we hear about there gonna be any potential cuts to anything. Um, but I've gotta deal with that reality as a chancellor. Here's one from Polly Spain about children who, are, uh, who have sickle cell anemia. They're often uh, identified as having emotion, being emotionally disturbed because they have outbursts in class and so forth. Uh, uh, and uh, the question is, what, uh, what uh, see, disturbed on, when they really are suffering in pain and, and do not have the language to articulate what is happening to them in kindergarten? So it's about the sickle cell anemia and sure. and, how, and recognizing it and what can be done. Yeah, I, I look into that very specifically. That's not one that's ever even come up to me in the year that I've been here. But we know, we know that we have a, so many of our children who have a host of, of issues and challenge. I, I can tell you for our kids with special needs. Um, they, we have never placed a level of priority and supports for them in the way that we really should. And, and that's why a lot of our kids actually leave the system, um, but they're also legally entitled to the services that they're supposed to get. And so um, uh, they wind up going to private schools. They, uh, we fund them for the, for the experience that they get at the private schools because we are legally mandated to provide those services. And if we don't provide them, we're on the hook for paying for it, no matter where it happens, yeah. where else it happens to be. Um, so I'm trying to build up uh, a stronger underpinning here to, to provide for all of our families, any and everything that they're supposed to get. Um, and it's, again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time to get there. But these are the kinds of things that we're, we're doing our best to get to. Uh, a, a sickle cell, I don't know what the percentage of our students who suffer from sickle cell specifically. Um, but I know I'll, it, it runs the whole gamut of all the issues and challenges that our kids have. And we've got some amazing places around the city, I got to tell you, that are expert, as good as any private school, anything that you would see anywhere, in how they support these students. We just don't have enough of them. 
And, uh, and that's what I've got to make sure that those are the kinds of things happen and we can scale some of this really good work. Here's uh, from Mark Diller. Uh, please share your vision regarding the renewed emphasis on gifted and talented tracking programs, especially as it relates to the initiative for greater equ equity of resources and opportunity for our most vulnerable students. Yeah, the prior, the prior administration, as we came in, had, had essentially turned it back on gifted and talented programs, in many ways sort of as inequitable, in some ways sort of as even racist. Um, uh, and we're on the record for those, for those, for those comments. Um, and the question as we came in was, okay, what are you going to do? Uh, and what I said I was going to do was to listen. And, and, I, and I moved around the entire city and I heard from communities across the city. And what I heard more than not, certainly not unanimous, but there's nothing that's unanimous in New York City, <laughs> right? The city is the mayor says of more than 8 million people, more than 50 million opinions. So there's not, there's no unanimity, just everybody thinks one way. Um, but what I heard more often than not was um, to please not get rid of the uh, gifted and talented programs. Um, and in fact, it was really being operated on a scarcity model. It was just a limited number. And so people were at each other's throats around who gets into those handful of places. And, uh, and so we asked the fundamental question, why, why does it need to be so limited? Uh, there are communities, as I was in uh, Queens yesterday and in Southeast Queens who said, we don't have any gifted and talented programs. Um, so we're not asking that you get rid of them because there's a level of inequity. We're asking that you fix the inequity by expanding the program and putting it in more program and more, and more neighborhoods. If you, if you put a gifted and talented program in Southeast Queens, you're going to get students of West Indian descent and more African-American kids just by definition, because those are the folks who live in that community. Um, and so we, we have now put at least one in every community school district in the city. And we're gonna study it. We're gonna see how it goes. Um, and we're gonna see, you know, we have one district which they were vehemently opposed to it. And we said, if that is the will and the sentiment of the people in that community, and they don't sign up for the program because they don't, they don't philosophically believe in it, fine. I mean, I, I'm not forcing anybody to do anything. I simply wanted to provide as many opportunities as possible. And, we'll, and we will watch it. We'll see, you know, people vote with their feet. And, uh, but what I don't want, I don't want people leaving the system because they see me or our, our administration as ideologues. I'm not an ideologue. I, I want to meet the people where they are. And, uh, and, 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 and so if you, there are communities, trust me, and I tell you, they want even more of these gifted and talented programs. They think they are of real value. Well, I, I wanna be a chancellor who is responsive to what the community is trying to do and not to simply impose my will because I think you know, I'm smarter than everybody or I'm right and you must be wrong and I'm gonna just dictate to you what's gonna happen. I'm not trying to do that, I'm trying to listen and I'm trying to be responsive. And I think when you do that, people feel heard, they feel respected, they feel engaged. And that's how you get people to buy in uh, and not continue to leave our system as they have been doing in droves. This will be the last question before we go to the colloquy. Irene uh, Nasirios, along with preparing students for careers in the future, is there any movement uh, in creating curriculum content that teaches students uh, how uh, teaches students how to manage their money once they have a career. Absolutely, that that is part and parcel of everything that we're working on right now. Um, we, we, this whole notion around financial literacy is it, 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 something that we are doing a deep dive on uh, right now. Uh, by by the time you see us get to the opening of our next school year, you're going to see a significant number of new course offerings and work that we're doing that really does speak to all these issues. The bright, the, the bright starts in the bold futures. The bold futures um, cannot be bold if kids don't understand when they graduate, you know, what to do with their money, how, how to save, how to invest, how to stop, how the stock market even works, how, how the economy works. Um, right now, they get a very limited exposure to that, in, in, including in some of our, you know, best schools. Kids are coming out and they, 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 they don't know how to manage their own money. Um, they don't know it deeply enough around how government, city government actually operates. Um, 
or, or the state or the federal government. They have some basic notion, but not significant enough. And, and that's why we ultimately produce young people who, who, who don't vote, who don't get engaged in, the, in this democracy. We're not asking the critical questions. Um, you know, my dad used to use the term, he said, there are three kinds of people, people who make stuff happen, people who watch stuff happen, and people who just wake up every day and say, hey, what happened, right? Um, we've got to produce more young people who make stuff happen. And in order to make stuff happen, you've got to know what's going on and you got to be paying attention. Um, we, we, we want to do a better job of developing that muscle in the K-12 space. So you haven't seen a lot of it, but we have behind the scenes, we're laying, we're planting a lot of the seeds in the preparation for these things, which you will see uh, soon enough. Uh, uh, may I I'm ask another question. Uh, uh, in your book, Soar, you spend a, a good bit of time talking about your upbringing and your brother's upbringing and, uh, the, uh, and your parents and their choices about where they lived and your schools. I wonder if you'd share some of that with us about your upbringing and how important those uh, issues and decisions were for you. Listen, um, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones, right? As I'm sure there are a lot of people here today who said, listen, I grew up with a great mom and dad. Uh, my, my mom was loving and, and tough, uh, five feet tall. And she was raising three boys <laughs> coming out of Brooklyn before we moved to Queens. And she was almost as tough as my dad. My dad was a New York City police officer. Uh, who arrested Mike Tyson twice in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. And, uh, and would come home every day with the idea that the, this craziness that he was seeing in the streets of Brownsville, he said, that's not going to happen to my boys. And so my dad was tough on us. He really was. And uh, he kept us on the straight and narrow. And uh, my, my youngest brother works for the Transit Authority, getting ready to retire. Um, you know, my other brother I mentioned is a deputy mayor, uh, myself. So, you know, between the three of us, we... We covered all the civil service jobs uh, it, 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 that New York City has to offer. But I say that to say we were lucky because we had loving, a nurturing mom and dad who had high expectations for us, who believed in us, who gave us everything we needed, and who fought really hard for us, fought for us to go to good schools, and uh, did the best that they could with what they had. And that's that's a new that's a New York story, right? Um, that so many of us could tell in, in our in our own way. Um, and, uh, and I've just been very, very fortunate. And I've taken everything that I've learned from my mom and dad and tried to close the gap for lots of kids, Ross, who, who don't have that, who didn't have a dad like I had, who, who was able to provide a level of discipline when it was necessary and love and direction and guidance uh, all along the way. There are a lot of kids who don't have that. And, uh, and we blame them when they get it wrong. And so I've committed my career to trying to help uh, bridge the gap for lots of kids who don't have uh, all of what I have. And I didn't, trust me, I didn't grow up with financial means at all, but, but I had love and I had direction and I had parents who gave a damn about me and, and fought hard for me and for my brothers. Uh, and I live with that every day. And, I, and every day of my career, I'm just simply trying to give that back as much as I possibly can. But I'm very clear as well. My mom and dad didn't do it alone. We had a larger village and that village was not just an extended family. There were friends, there were people from the community who, who also poured into us. And that's why I'm saying I need people like the folks who join you on these kinds of calls um, to not just be on the sidelines and hear from me and say, that was a great conversation, but rather say, how can we get involved? We can do a little something more perhaps than we've been doing. That's what it's going to take. Um, I think to ultimately transform. Otherwise, people are just on the sidelines and watching what the chancellor does and offering up their critique uh, as they want to. The question is, where are you in this space? Are you a partner and actually providing opportunities to make things better? I actually hear the criticism and the critique from people better who are actually in the fight with me. Otherwise, people are just on the sidelines watching. Everybody can have their opinion that that doesn't phase me. Um, I'm, 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 I'm much more respectful of people who say, Count me in, we wanna help uh, because it's gonna take all of that to ultimately uh, get the results that we're looking for. Thank you for sharing so much of yourself and your time and your, your experience mm -hmm. in your life. It's really wonderful to hear it. I'm gonna turn the uh, conversation over to Dean Anthony Crowell. Dean Crowell, are you with us? I am. 
You just need to have the video put on. <laughs> That should do it. Good morning, Chancellor. Thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it and it's nice to see you. Thank you. So um, I, I appreciate your uh, your comments about being a graduate of the evening division at St. John's. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an evening division grad from a different school and we have one of the largest evening divisions here at NYLS. So uh, certainly as, as I think you might agree, uh, evening division grads from law school can go on and do anything. And, and you certainly have, uh, have exemplified that. So, uh, so terrific. Um, I, I have a couple of questions that are in two different tranches. I'll start with, with one that um, is necessary and important to some of my faculty colleagues. Um, as you might know, New York Law School has a, a wonderful set of programs for children and families. Um, and one of our signature initiatives is our Education uh, Law and Policy uh, Institute. Uh, they're doing a bunch of work on special education. And um, the questions were, are there any plans to reform the process to make it easier to, um, for parents to obtain, to obtain independent educational evaluations for children? Um, and then the second question is, any plans to reform the pendency process, making it easier for a child to be placed when there's no dispute about the last agreed upon placement? And then any efforts um, at giving a, a fuller range of resources to those classified as twice exceptional students? You know, all great questions. I'd certainly love if, uh, if they would put all that in writing, send something to me. I'd love to explore all these issues much more deeply. I will say this, it's one of the first things when Michael Mogul, the head of the UFT, before I became chancellor, told me, he said, the first thing you gotta do, you gotta fix uh, special ed. Uh, there's going to be a federal monitor that gets put on it if you don't. And he was absolutely right. Um, it, it, you know, there's a tone that gets set from prior administrations around, you know, how much they're going to make parents fight, uh, you know, for the kinds of supports and services that they're entitled to. And they have tremendous financial uh, implications. We've made a decision that, you know, we don't want parents to have to jump through every hoop. So I'm, I'm doing everything I can right now to try to fix a, lo a lot of these Policies. We've made a series of announcements that have been a strong signal to the community uh, uh, that we are prioritizing them, uh, that we want to be much more supportive. The, the, this thing is multi-layered, um, uh, but we are we are we are in fact committed to making this uh, much more user-friendly. Uh, people should not have to battle uh, to do this. Um, you know, I had made a comment uh, that had come under some fire a while ago because. You know, these, the, the Carter cases, as we refer to them, are, are really those who wind up going, uh, you know, getting services outside of our school system. Um, and the amount of money that we spent on those Carter cases has exploded exponentially over like the last two years. For years, we were spending about $300 million a year um, to support students and their families outside of the system. And now we're up to about $1.2 billion that we're spending. Um, and, and, and it's my sense that um, if we did what we were supposed to do here, you we, we, we wouldn't have people looking to leave the system. So we're trying to re-engage parents and families, build a greater degree of trust um, in this process. But in order to do that, uh, we've got we've to touch on all these things that you just raised um, so, that, uh, so that folks feel like there is a place and space for them here and, and, the, and the needs of their uh, kids are gonna be uh, better met. So uh, that's what we're working on. And again, these things don't happen overnight. I, I got like a hundred things that people would say should be my priorities here in a system this large. <laughs> you know, we have 148,000 employees. I mean, this is, it's as big as larger than most of these Fortune 500 companies. Um, so it, it, things don't turn on a dime because you're also working with unions and everything else and all kinds of rules and regulations. Um, but it is a priority for us to begin to turn some of those things around deep. Great, and I'll make sure my colleagues follow up. But we appreciate Please. your openness to that, and and I totally respect the scale at which you operate. And you know, DOE is its own its own separate government, its own separate city within the city. So uh, I respect that. Um, let me ask you, um, and this is a little bit on the in the category of personal advice. As, as someone who works in higher ed, I'm always thinking about what we need to be doing to prepare for the next generation of students coming in. 
you're building that next generation for us. I know you're working with the community colleges and the four-year colleges. Um, <clears throat> but generally, what advice do you have for higher ed leaders about, about the steps they need to be taking now to prepare for the next five to 10 years for the students who you're producing and graduating? You know, I, I was an engineering major for the first two years when I was at Rutgers uh, before I switched to political science. And um, while I was there, I remember going through taking all of these courses, uh, geometronics and all of this stuff. And, and there was not enough of a career focus of what, where it could ultimately lead to. I know ultimately I could be an engineer, but, 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 but I don't think they did a good enough job of helping give a, degree of, a greater degree of clarity around what happens at the end of this run. What are the possibilities? You kind of left a lot of that. You were left on your own to figure a lot of those things out. So some of the advice that I would give to uh, higher ed leaders is much like what we are going through here right now. We, we have to have a bit more of a focus on career connected learning. What, what Helping to marshal the, po the possibilities of what your school experience could ultimately lend itself to, no matter what it is that you make. Even if you're an art major, you're a dance major. I'm not just talking about people who are just going into just corporate business or technology. Whatever it happens to be that we need to build in, I think, um, a little bit more guardrails and guidance toward um, now what? And kids shouldn't have to just figure all of those things out on their own. Like our job was just to take you through the day-to-day -day routine of exposing you to knowledge. But whatever you decide to do, that, that's up to you uh, and how you get there being up to you. Um, I, think, I think you help kids and young people, even at, at the higher ed level, I think you help them more by bringing more clarity to defining what your ultimate pathway could be. Um, that's the ultimate aha, because when you get that aha, you will run toward it. And, you, and in fact, you become a better student while you're at it. But when you don't know where it goes, you, you're kind of doing it because, you know, mommy and daddy sent me to college. I'm supposed to get a degree. You know, I may, I don't know what I'm going to do ultimately, but I've got, I know I've got to do this. Um, I think we could have more purpose in that process. Um, and it could look different in lots of different places, but I do think that that is important. I know that's what I'm facing here. And, but as I, as I do that here, I'd love to know that I'm handing them off to places which are of like mind that we'll take from here and helping to guide them all the way through. We, we're sitting here in New York City with hundreds of thousands of jobs that are available for young people that are going unused. And, 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 and so these corporations wind up going across the world to try to find people to place in these jobs. I, I graduate 80,000 kids every single year. We, we should be, it has to be more purposeful for kids to wind up in real careers and in industry, or as I like to say, getting off of mommy and daddy's payroll. I think there's a role that we can all play in doing that. Yeah, I think that's brilliant advice and I appreciate it. And I'm very much in agreement on, on giving great clarity and context to the purpose of what education is and where it leads ultimately. That's great advice and much appreciated. Um, your wisdom and your commitment are unparalleled. We appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. I'm going to kick it back to Ross. But uh, again, thank you for all you do for our city, our children, and uh, you're much appreciated. I appreciate that as well, Dean. I, I do have to jump. I'm late for a meeting with the mayor, so I've got to run across the street to City Hall now. Okay, before you go, I want to thank you. And I also want to tout your book. I think it's a worth read. I, I really enjoyed it. And I congratulate you. And thank you for sharing so much of your time today and your thoughts and your inspirational goals. Thank right. you so much. We'll right. be back uh, in 2023 with more of these City Law Breakfast. Thank you.